This is Nicole Sauce from the Holler Homestead giving you a woman's take on the walk towards independence because we're living free in Tennessee. Top of the week to you. It's Monday, May 8th, 2017, and this is episode 35 of Living Free in Tennessee. And what a weekend we had here at the Holler Homestead. In today's show, I will share with you a Holler Homestead update and a coffee update, and then talk a little bit about the healthcare hubaboo and what I've been able to find out about what has and what has not really changed so far as a result of the House passing the legislation last week. And we're also going to talk about what that means to you and to me. Then I will walk you through project two of my learning canning in eight projects project. Um, Projects project. That's kind of fun to say. And we'll talk a bit about how and when the video series is coming out because we have a plan for that finally rather than the I might record it. I have somebody to help me record it, but I don't know when. Now I know when. So we'll do that. And project two is canning peaches, just so you know. But before we dive in, if you want to drop me a note, topic, idea, or comment, you can email it to NicoleSauce at gmail.com or leave a comment over at livingfreeintennessee.com. Okay, guys, now it's time for our regular segments. And the first one we have is eating seasonally and tales from the prepper pantry. Really, at this point, It's all about Tales from the Prepper Pantry and a lot less about eating, um, I'm sorry, it's all about eating seasonally and a lot less about Tales from the Prepper Pantry, but we are still eating some things from the pantry. Like, we don't have green beans and corn and beets coming out of the ground yet, although we will shortly on the beets. Uh, So those sorts of things we are eating from the pantry and augmenting what's coming out of the garden. And this is still salad palooza time, that's right. Not only is it salad palooza, but cabbages have started coming on. And as many of you know, I don't do spring cabbage in my garden because it turns into the epic battle of the bugs and Nicole sauce. So we don't do that. But for some reason, some of my friends are able to win that battle. And so when I see cabbages at the farmer's market, I usually get grab a few and make some nice spring sauerkraut and, you know, coleslaw, all those good things. Um... A note on tomatoes, speaking of farmer's markets, they aren't from here. You know, when I moved here, people would hear me talk and they'd say, you're not from here, are you? Because I was usually asking some sort of question they'd never heard anybody ask before. But the tomatoes that you're seeing in the farmer's market around here are either coming from a greenhouse and frankly don't taste as good as the real ones that come out of the sunny weather in the garden, or they're shipped up from somewhere to the south of us and therefore don't usually taste as good. They're not as bad as the ones in Walmart, which are bred to ship for a gajillion years. Uh, But what I've noticed is we have people selling quote unquote local tomatoes that really aren't from here. When you go ask them, they usually say, oh yeah, we got those tomatoes from Georgia or we got those tomatoes from Florida. And what's happened then in order for that to happen is the tomato has been picked when it's not ripe, put in a box, shipped up here and become ripe. Not the end of the world, uh, but still not quite as good as the vine ripe. So if you're if you're hankering for tomatoes, by all means, grab them. I like to wait till I know that they're coming off the vine in the right way, unless I get a little push from Mark to get tomatoes for hamburgers or something. The other thing that's starting to come on are the green onions. These are, you know, like the pre-big bulbous onion onion. Those are really yummy, and they're great. It's chopped up on salads, but also really good in stir fry. So we're hitting stir fry season I was up in my garden earlier today, and guess what I saw? Garlic scapes. Do you know what a garlic scape is? It is the part of the plant that would be a flower if you didn't harvest it and eat it. So they're round, and they're these shoots that come out the middle, and they have a little soon-to-be flower at the top. And you, I like to get them when they're, you know, first day or two coming out. Harvest them, and you cut them up. And you can use them in stir fry as a, just a light garlic flavor, but how they're really good is in garlic scape pesto. So basically you follow a pesto recipe, but instead of using basil, you put garlic scapes in the same amount, same weight, basically. So it is that time. And then I also, when I do the garlic scape pesto, don't add actual garlic bulbs. I just let the 
the uh, garlic scapes speak for themselves. It's so good. So, you know, olive oil, salt, pepper, garlic scapes, grind it up, add parm, put it on pasta, get fat. That's what you do right there. Then we also have kale. My kale is looking great. I didn't plant kale this year, but it planted itself. And anytime something will plant itself in my garden, that usually means it's it's in the right place and uh, on the right schedule. Then broccoli. We got broccoli coming on. And all of that means stir fry season has hit. And this just means that we make a lot of stir fries with rice and then they're around in the fridge for a while. That does not preclude us from making pottage every week, but... It's just another dynamic to the meal plan in the country. And then on the wild side, dead nettle's gone. Chickweed is too large and starting to taste funny. Watercress is really peppery. Like the only use for watercress for me at this point is boil it in soup or it's flowering where we are. So it has these little white flowers. You can put a few of those little white flowers on your salad and it's, it's not too, you know, in light amounts, not too peppery. Pokeweed is getting larger than I want to eat it. And the Jerusalem artichokes are well into their leafing out phase, which means that the tubers are not, they're like hollow right now. So you don't really, they're not really what I'd be eating. But the daylilies are still yummy. Uh, You can get the young daylily shoots or uh, you can go into the roots. They're not hollow yet. Um, The dandelions, there are, there's a second wave of dandelions coming on here. So I've got some young dandelion greens that go well on salad Wild garlic's gone. So we're kind of into this interesting transition from spring to summer here, even though the calendar hasn't told us it's summertime yet. And theoretically, coming from the garden seasonally, are new potatoes. I have seen them at farmer's markets. I have not dug in my garden to see if I have any. I probably do because my potato plants are like a foot tall now. And if I dig, I'll probably find tiny little potatoes. Although maybe not because we've had a lot of water. So uh, I find that my potatoes like to potato out when it's dry a little bit, interestingly enough. So you let them get dry and then you give some water and then they go bloop. So um, haven't done that. Probably will look around in the potato patches later this week. And eggs, lots of eggs. And that means for us sandwich salad. So sandwich salad is, you know how like egg salad sandwiches? Mm, So that's a sandwich salad or... Um, tuna fish salad, you put tuna fish and chop up hard boiled eggs and you put mayonnaise and blah, 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 and pickles. Um, basically sandwich salad is any meat at its core. Like we will take leftover barbecued venison from the night before, grind it up with hard boiled eggs and mayonnaise and spices and it becomes a spread and we'll do it with salmon. We'll do it with venison. We'll do it with beef. We'll do it with chicken. We'll do it with ham. Like anything that's left over, it's sandwich salad time. And that helps us use up some eggs, but also helps us get through our leftovers. Next up, we have getting the gardens ready, where we share what we're doing to get our food growing operation up and running. That sounds so tidy, doesn't it? It's not very tidy here right now. Um, I had the best of intentions last week, and the thing that did get deprioritized was this segment. So, yeah, I'll tell you more about that in the holler update, but this week we are getting the last of the garden planting in. There will be a second wave in July, but basically everything's going in now. My sweet potatoes are going in, although I'm on the fence on that one, but they're going in. We'll see how that goes. The tomatoes are going out, the peppers are going in, any uh, cucumber seeds are going in. Just making sure it's all set to go, and then I can focus on maintenance. That's what we're doing to get the gardens ready, and I should have had much of that done already, and I don't because stuff. Um, I'm also attacking the bramble. The bramble is a big mistake I made when I hired somebody one summer to help me get a bunch of plants in and then did not properly supervise them, and they planted. I told them to plant five feet from, I like put blueberries here, put them four feet apart, and then five feet from that start the raspberries, and they planted everything 12 inches. So you can understand, I mean, if you know anything about vining plants and vining raspberry plants, you'll know that what's happened is I can't find my blueberry bushes under the raspberries. So um, time to hit that again and hopefully free up the blueberries to give us blueberries. But luckily, I also have 
two blueberry bushes that are going elsewhere on the property in a new blueberry patch near it's we call it garden grow uh, garbage grove on our property and it's where we we basically digest um the kinds of things you don't want to throw in your composting bin like bones and whatnot in an underground area so it doesn't stink um it's green cone is there and it, it releases a lot of nitrogen very it's a very good place to grow things so we're going to throw some blueberries over on gar garbage grove and then we're also getting ready our garlic and pepper like cayenne pepper tea which will be sprayed on all the fruit trees and any plants that are dealing with flea beetles right now because we've had a bit of a flea be beetle visitation at the lower levels of our green beans in fact when I grow green beans, I always get the climbing kind because I get pest pressure for the first 12 inches. And then as they get taller, it's like the flea beetles don't go up the vine. Then I'm only dealing with your like Japanese beetle pressure, which usually isn't too bad. Hopefully this year the ducks will help me with some of that. And then we're launching into Operation Shade Creation. It's taken me years to figure this out, but... My stuff in my garden, it's more important I figure out how to get it shade than how to get it in the sun. So this year we're putting up on posts some, it's basically, land. it's not landscaping cloth, but it's like landscaping cloth. It's white though, so it's row cover, but it's fabric, so rain will soak through it. Putting that up to just give a little relief from the sun in some parts of my garden that are pretty, well, pretty sun drenched. And then also the way we've designed, I mean, last year we'd already done this. With the way we've designed our beds, we have cattle panels up so that we can put things on them, which creates shade pockets. So just thinking about that, thinking about where I put things. I did also um, trim up the, the we have um, elderberries growing in a ring around one of my raised beds. And I trimmed those up so they'll give it shade but let some sun in. So we'll have a, a salad bed there as long as we can. In Tennessee, salad goes away. And then the other thing about getting the gardens ready is it's bee food time. And that doesn't mean sugar water in the hives, guys. That means I'm letting things get tall and bloom so that when the bees come out, they have something to eat. Because in my garden... There's not much for them to uh, pollinate, although there will be shortly. And I want to keep them around and keep them happy and keep them vibrant. But more on vibrant bees later, later today. Garden ec economics project update. I was going to spend money and then I didn't have to. And it's all because it was cold on Saturday morning, guys. I went to the farmer's market just to see, you know, check in with everybody, see what's going on. And they had plants for sale. And this is like the hardest thing about keeping my costs down is I see other people with plants for sale and I buy plants. Well, I thought, you know what? My peppers, I started a little late. They're a little short. There's some nice looking cayenne pepper plants. Cayenne pepper is my most important pepper to produce here. So I'll just get three cayenne pepper plants, which is plenty for us. And then, you know, go about my day. Well, these plants looked horrible I mean they looked really bad and the guy like handed me the three pepper plants and I said how much and he's like oh I can't charge you from those I I think that the, they've been wind because the, the wind blows across the farmer's market I think they've just been stressed by the wind so bad I'm not sure they're gonna live so I'll tell you what take these plants and you know, if they look better in a week or two, let me know and we'll work something out. But I just, I'm going to end up throwing them away when I get home. And I was like, really? Because those don't look like they're wind burned. They look like they're cold because it was cold on Saturday morning. They were like, and peppers, when they're cold, they like, they go, hey, I want to go back in the dirt. And they like wilt up. They look worse than if you don't water them when they're cold. So he handed me the plants. I took them home, put them in my kitchen. I didn't put them in the greenhouse. I kept them extra warm because we had a fire on Saturday. And these plants look great. So I have three free plants right now. However, I will go back and see what he wants for them and tell him what happened. But yeah, sometimes when your plants look really sad, it's not because of water. It's not because of nutrition. And it's not because of sun or rain. It's because they're cold. Some plants don't like being cold. Peppers don't like being cold. So let's get on to the main topic of the show. I'm going to start with health care. Dude, Whiskey Tango Foxtrot, man. They passed this thing last week. 
And, you know, before I really dive into it, I do want to put a disclaimer out. I'm probably going to make some of you mad. And that's okay, I guess. I'm not going to pull punches on this one. Um, And I don't think we've talked much about where I am politically, and I don't know that it matters. But I can tell you this. When I see righties making mistakes, I call them on it. When I see lefties making mistakes, I call them on it. And I don't care if you have a D or an R next to your name. If you're doing baloney, I'm going to call you on it. And I do think that the system of government we have, which has divided us into two parts that are not very well organized, I would have to say. You know, you got people on the right who wish leftish things would happen and people on the left who wish wish rightish things would happen, but they just don't want the righties doing it. Like the way they've separated us is how they're controlling us. So I'm going to talk about healthcare, and I'll probably critique both sides of the issue, and that is what is what it is. So late last week, the House passed a bill to fix the Affordable Care Act, or Obamacare, as some like to call it. And since that time, I have seen so much spin from both sides that I'm dizzy. I can't even stand up without falling over when I think about this, because both sides are lying their butts off. They didn't pass anything that significantly changed anything. So we haven't fixed crap. And at the same time, they also have not put us in a situation where rape is a pre-existing condition. So I'm just going to beg you when you see people saying what this law is and what it does, think about who's talking and go look for yourself. Now, I've worked in the public policy arena for more than 12 years which means I've gotten really used to reading public policy documents and trying to figure out what that what they actually mean. And a lot of times when we hear about something like this reform that was passed through the House last week, we hear the spin, but we don't look underneath the hood to see what kind of engine's in there. And that was a big problem with the Affordable Care Act. It was, I don't know, what, 1,400 pages of problem. Like, why do we even need that many pages in any law ever? We managed to found the country on a very a much shorter document, by the way, and it seems to have been working fairly well for a long time. Um, and so I, my, I guess my other upfront disclaimer is I have not read what was passed, and I will tell you why. Because I've worked in policy for 12 years, I know that what has passed the House is not what we're going to get. They're handing it over to the Senate. Then the Senate will dick around with it then they'll probably do some sort of like remediation where they figure out how they agree and then they'll hand it to the president and he'll sign it. That's if everything goes well. So one branch of government passing something means nothing. And I do believe that they're going to get this all the way through, by the way. I just don't know what it will really be. And so I could not see investing the time to sit down and really read what was going on until something has actually gone on. And part of that is because I know that if I and 4 billion other people call legislators to make changes and leave messages, it's still not going to change the outcome at this point. This thing has been in the works for a while and they don't care what we think. So when I look at how the process works, I look at what I can do to change lives for the better. What isn't going to help me change lives for the better is reading something that's not even what really has passed or been enacted. Nothing has been enacted yet. So I did, however, go to some of my trusted sources because some of my friends, by the way, read this crap. They read this crap for a living and they figure out what it means and they don't care who wrote it. They're going to read it and figure it out. So um, is the individual mandate in place? This is what's changed. Um, If it goes through as it is now, the individual mandate is gone. That means you cannot be fined or taxed or whatever they want to call it for not having health insurance. Now, If we think about what the Affordable Care Act was, it was like a three-legged stool. And in order to hold up the the seat of the stool, you needed these three legs to all work. The first one was that mandate. So we've just seen them remove one of the stools. Now there's the legs of the stool. Now there's only two legs left. The second one was the exchanges, like having a quote-unquote marketplace where you could shop for insurance under the idea that if you could shop for insurance, you could buy it, get the better price. Well, exchanges have blew up a long time ago because they never did set up a system in with, with the Affordable Care Act where there was any actual competition. And so you could go online and shop for insurance, but you always could. 
that's that's the funny thing. I think it was healthinsurance.com where you could go and it would just look up it it already had that logic in place. But yeah, you know, it's neither here nor there. They they encourage states to make their own marketplace and then when the states realized that was way too expensive, they uh they set up the the national one, healthcare.gov. And um so that was one of the legs of the stool. That stool's that leg of the stool's already broken. And then the third leg of the school stool was to expand medic Medicaid coverage to people who were not previously eligible. And, you know, this is where we say, okay, Medicare, old people insurance, Medicaid, poor people insurance. They, I think they named them close to each other just to mess with us. So we would get really confused about what's what. So Medicaid expansion was voluntary by state. So if your state opted in, they could expand it to cover more people. So you didn't have to be um, in, in the same definition of poverty as, as you had to be previously. And that leg of the stool was already a little wobbly because a number of states did not expand. Um, so the next thing that has changed is that Medicaid cannot be expanded in any additional states, but the states who already expanded coverage to people aren't losing that. That's still there. Um, they are going to be leaving the states to pay for what they've agreed to. And that was the plan all along. The plan all along with expanding Medicaid was the, the federal government would help you pay for it and then reduce that help year over year so while, while the states increased their contribution. So, you know, so two things have changed. Individual mandates gone. Medicaid can no longer be expanded in the states who haven't already. But the ones who already did still have it. Some of the taxes added by the ACA are gone. And and the spin is that like, oh, these huge number of taxes are gone. Okay, some are gone. Yep, some are gone. And they're counting on in increased efficiency to cover that gap. Uh, yeah, interesting. We're asking the government to be efficient. Pre-existing conditions. This is the big one. This is the big one they're arguing about. This is where they're misleading you really badly. Both sides are. Pre-existing conditions do not have to be covered for one year. So if you right now don't have insurance and you have a pre-existing condition and you have not had insurance for more than 63 days, your pre-existing condition, if you have cancer or whatever, doesn't have to be covered at the same rates for one year. And then it's just covered. That's how it's written right now. I don't know if it'll stay that way. And this is a lot of ifs, buts, and ands. So we, we're going from a system where you were supposed to have insurance to begin with. So pre-existing conditions can be not covered for one year if you've let your insurance lapse for more than three, 63 days. And as I read it, it's not that they say, nope, we're going to exempt that. It's that they say, oh, we're going to charge you 30% more on your premium for that first year. Guys, that's not a big change. I mean, it's going to feel like a big change because all of our premiums have gone up so bloody high that, you know, 30% of $550 for one person who's not sick is a lot. Then again, that's for one person who is sick. So that's, that's an actual change. Um, and I've just been watching meme after meme after meme go around about this, um, the Republican spin is that this is reform is somehow different than the ACA and it's fixed everything, right? Yay. Okay. Yeah. They just broke another leg of that stool, but the whole thing wasn't viable to begin with. So they're helping it crash faster. Why are they helping it crash faster? Ask yourself that question. Cause they didn't add any competition to the market. They didn't make it so I can buy insurance from anybody and I can cover whatever I want to. In fact, currently, the same list of things that need to be covered, that t list of 10 things that have to be in all insurance policies, it remains. They haven't said you don't have to cover that. So that hasn't changed. They And they haven't made it so that like I can buy my insurance policy in Missouri on the open market, even though I live in Tennessee. Nope, that hasn't changed. So all they've done is really like significantly gotten rid of the individual mandate, which people were ignoring anyway, because insurance premiums on the private market had gotten so high that it was cheaper to pay the fine than to get the insurance at, at some point. So yeah, this will ultimately hurt the Republicans credibility when it comes crashing down because it's going to, and they haven't really under addressed any of the underlying flaws of the law. And all they've managed to do is pass a bill that lets them scream victory. 
Yay, we won. Okay. Um, Democrats spin is that rape is a pre-existing condition. This is horseshit. I actually looked into that one because I was like, what? That can't be right. And it's not right. The steps that, I mean, like, it's feasible if you go through a very long series of steps to get there that somebody who was raped may end up with a pre-existing condition that is not covered. But you have to have let your insurance lapse for, for 63 days. You have to have done something like contracted HIV as part of being raped. And you have to be in a state that has applied to the federal government for an exemption from covering the 10 things that are listed in the ACA to begin with, which they don't even have a process in place for. And it's entirely unlikely that any state would bother to do. And then there's like four other things that have to happen. And then, yeah, sure, maybe something that happened when you were raped won't be covered. But Democrats running around saying that rape is now a pre-existing condition is so convoluted to get there that it makes makes them hurt their own cause. Like, it's so easy to call them out on that one that they're, they just look like big liars and big whiners. So, you know, on the one side, we've got the Republicans claiming this huge victory and not helping anybody, really. I mean, I guess it's good that we're not going to get fined this year for the individual. Basically, they've removed a tax on the individual who couldn't afford their insurance. And you've got Democrats talking about rape being made into a pre-existing condition. Both of them are lying. Both of them are going to look like they have egg on their face when the whole law comes crashing down. And it's all part of the plan. So what should I, the homesteader, do about this? Nothing. Basically, this process is out of our hands. And, you know, when you think about, you know, seven, was it, seven habits of highly effective people, you've got your circle of concern and your circle of influence. Circle of concern, am I concerned about health care crashing? And yeah, I actually am. But can I influence what's going on at the national level? No, I can't. And I don't care how doughy-eyed you are. I'm an optimist. As I said, four billion calls to my legislator is not going to change what's going on right now. What's going on right now is they're designing a system to fail so that they can put single payer in. That's what they're doing. And in order for single payer to ever pass in this country, Republicans have to do it. So they're just still, they're playing the game they were always planning to play. And we're just being manipulated by them through our emotions to fight with each other so that we're so busy fighting with each other, we don't realize what they're doing on the national level. And if we want to take control of our health care, we have to help as many of those around us see this in a less hysterical way. I mean, I think everyone can agree to the degree possible that we can, we would like to help sick people recover, right? I want to help sick people. If if my neighbor has a heart condition, I, want, I, I don't want them to die. I don't want my theoretical neighbor who I never met with that heart condition to die. Like I, I want these people to be able to get care. And if they have really crazy expensive conditions, like being born with half a heart or whatever, I do want them to live the best life they can live. And I know it costs money. And I know sometimes I, as a member of my community, should try to help them. Even if they're in California and I'm in Tennessee or whatever. Like, I agree that we need to help people and that people should have access to medical care. That's my core belief. And that's where I try to go with people when I'm talking about healthcare. What's your end result? What do you really want? And if you're talking with somebody about that and they will agree to the desired end result, that's great. You can actually have a conversation and say, okay, well, is the government the best way to get us there? Is ceding all the power to the feds who won't even put in the same plan for Congress as they do for the rest of the country, is that the best way to get the core end result? Or are we opening ourselves up to being at the whim of special interests of all kinds? Government special interests, corporate special interests, just people who are looking to make money off of forcing other people to do things. Uh, Is that the best way? I don't know. I don't personally think it is. Let's have a talk about that. So if they agree with you that the desired end result is access to healthcare, but are not interested in exploring different ways to get it than their team tells them to go, their D team or their R team, it's time for you to take the high road and end, end the discussion. Because if they are so, they've so tied their identity to a method rather than a result, 
and they are not ready to examine the flaw in that whole set of choices, then nothing you can say in a debate will move them. And in fact, if you attack their identity attachment to a method, you're going to make them stick to it stronger. So the best thing you can do is leave them knowing that when the time comes, they can talk to you because you're not going to judge them. You're not going to be mad at them for having once thought that this method or that method was more important than actual health results for people and that you're a kind press person that they can trust to talk things through. I mean, it makes me think of way back when I lived, gosh, before I came over to the Liberty perspective, I, I was not Liberty at all. And I just happened to be really good friends with somebody who was very Liberty oriented and he never forced anything on me. But when I started evaluating what wasn't working in mass transit planning, I was like, yeah, but how do we, what about the police? How does this work? And often in Liberty circles, the answer to what about the police results in you being ridiculed? Well, that's not good. If he, if he had ridiculed me, I would have been like middle finger up. I'm going back to my other belief system. Same with this healthcare thing. I mean, if you, it, healthcare is so emotional because we all know somebody who needs it and we want them to get it and we love them. And it's hard to be reasonable and objective in that situation. And that's why we need to be empowering when we're talking about healthcare rather than spin it like a bunch of horse shit about rape being a a pre-existing condition or that whatever the Republicans just passed in the house is actually a law right now, which it's not. And B a significant change to anything that was already there. It's not, um, I mean, basically, so I've just told you the long term, the long, uh, version of learn how to take care of yourself as best you can, because they're not taking care of you through anything they're doing in Washington right now in healthcare. And don't be an asshole to people who don't get it yet. Be an empower, listen to them end the conversation if it's clear it's not going anywhere because they'll remember that later. You know, that reminds me, a friend on Facebook put up something this week. It said, um, it's globalism versus nationalism. Which are you? That question is flawed, guys. That only gives me two choices. Maybe I'm a humanist. Maybe I'm a universalist. Maybe I'm nothing. Maybe I'm nothing. Maybe I don't see the difference between those two choices, really. I mean, like, you have the overlords of the globe versus the overlords of the country. Like, overlord, that's the problem. You know, you're asking me to choose which king. I don't, I choose no king. So, and healthcare is kind of the same way. Like, the Democrat version or the Republican version, it's all kind of like, which really messed up system do I want to participate in? Neither. Actually, what I want is for people to get access to healthcare. I, I, I want people who need new new limbs to be able to get prosthetic limbs and, and go on with their lives. So I'm just going to do my best to support our innovative medical providers directly. We've got some really good ones in Tennessee and I'm going to give them my business. I'm going to do my best to keep myself covered with some insurance in the event of a catastrophe that I have not been able to plan for. And unfortunately, I'm going to have to have a plan B because if the whole system crashes when my time to need it comes, I've got to have a system in place to take care of myself. And I'm pretty sure that as old as I am, I'm most likely to get sick, uh, you know, breast cancer or something, if I'm going to get it, right when there's nothing in place for me. And and that is their end goal, guys. It's, you know, their end goal isn't to provide a system that provides care for all the all of us. It's It is to crash the system so they can put something in place that allows them to have even more control and to pay off their buddies at an even higher level. And so in other words, I'm going to plant poppies. And for anybody who knows anything about poppies, you know why I would want to plant poppies as my plan B. And then we're going to wait to see what really passes before getting all upset about any of this, because what has passed the house has not passed and been signed into law unless it's happening while I'm talking, which is totally possible. And as I said, 14 billion calls aren't going to stop it. Okay. So I started with that segment. I wasn't even going to talk about healthcare until I had read it and something had passed all the way. But then I had so many questions about healthcare. I thought I'd just give you my two cents. That's my take on it. And then I put it first because it's kind of a bummer, isn't it? It's a bummer because we're watching our parents not get care. We're watching our kids struggle. 
I'm, I mean, I'm struggling myself with even paying for my health share at this point and, and how much stuff has inflated over the last four years. Um, it's kind of depressing, but we can go on to some more positive talkets. So let's, let's go into the Holler Homestead update. Really, this is a, just my excuse to tell you what happened this weekend. So I was so organized. Um, we had so much. I, you all know it's just rained and rained and rained here. And I could see the weather coming, the clearing in advance. So I sat down with Mama Sauce and we kind of sketched out, okay, each day this weekend, this is what we can achieve for the homestead. And we won't have to get all muddy and gross because the rains are finally gone. And so what we planned to do was the rest of the garden prep and some, you know, getting ready for the goats. And we were going to go on a nice kayaking trip because whenever mom comes out, it's like the homestead explodes everywhere. and We never do anything off the homestead that's fun. Now, I consider working on my homestead fun, but, you know, sometimes you just got to go kayaking, right? And here's what really happened. Bees. The bees noticed that it stopped raining. You know what they did? They swarmed. Yep, guys, I caught a swarm on Saturday, 1 o'clock, walked outside. Mark said the bees were acting funny, and they were. I was like, oh, that's a swarm, and it settled right where we could get it. So Mom and I bee-suited up, and we we caught the swarm. We put it in a box, um, and then we put the box upside down over a hive and walked away and let them calm down because they were pretty upset with us at that point. And then a few hours later, walked back out, pulled the bin off, um, causing more chaos, but got the lid on the hive and they were all tucked away, right? No, we went back and checked an hour later and the queen, bless her heart, had walked outside the hive and was sitting on the outside of the hive with uh, bees bearding around her. And so we put our suits back on, put her back in the hive, scooped up as many bees as we could in the hive, and then we just sat there and watched for like 45 minutes while the rest of the bees outside the hive went inside the hive. And finally... Her Highness decided to stay for the night. I mean, it was the reason I was worried about this is it was going to be 40 degrees. So as you can imagine that day, guess how much I got done in the garden? Nada. Guess how much goat prep I got ready to go? Nada. Did I go kayaking with mom? I did not go kayaking with mom. We cooked dinner, went to bed tired, um, checked on the hive next morning and they decided to stay put. So that was good. I caught a hive. So then that day I sat down over breakfast with mom. I'm like, okay, we can still do this. I will put a time, I'll work in the garden for a couple hours this morning. I won't get everything done, but I'll, I'll do what I can for two hours. Then I'll eat lunch, take a rest and we'll throw the kayaks in the truck and go on this like seven mile paddle down the, down one of the creeks And she's like, sounds good. And she was off doing something else. And I walked outside and guess what? Bees. Same hive. Swarming. Kicking myself in the butt for not having gone in that hive to see um, why we had the swarm to begin with. Because this is the same hive that swarmed a few weeks ago. And I should have taken that as a sign there's something wrong with the hive because they just swarmed twice. Okay, now they've swarmed three times, guys. And um, I was like, Mom, it's time to go kayaking, but I'm looking at bees. And I have to say, the good news was I had gotten one hour in the garden, so I had made some progress. I've been documenting this, so that's fine. So yeah, bees. So we sued up. They landed too high for me to reach them in my shrubs. And I tried four or five ways and then Mark and I debated and we spent like an hour like looking at this, the swarm. And finally I was just like, screw it. Put it out on Facebook to a friend. I'm like, Hey, if you want a swarm, it's too high for me to get. You need like a 12 foot ladder. I don't have time. And I threw my rear end in the truck with a sandwich and I went kayaking with mom. And I came back and my friend was there with his ladder and he caught the swarm. So he went away. So, um, you know, that's a really good illustration of how things are on a homestead. You think you're going to do something and you don't. And at some point you do have to cut your losses. Like there I was, I had yet another swarm. I don't have any hives to put them in, but I do have friends with hives. So I gave that swarm away. Felt pretty good by the end of the day, the day yesterday. I got one hour in the garden. Didn't get my tomatoes out, but they'll go out today. And I kept my overall personal long-term goals in mind of not getting really stressed out, taking care of my health, 
And the way I take care of my health is partially by growing our own food and remembering to integrate recreation into life. Because when I die, I'm not going to be like, I wish I would have caught one more, one more swarm. I'm going to be like, I wish I would have spent more time with my mom in a kayak. So we went on this fantastic kayak yesterday afternoon and the weather was perfect. And just at the end, we got a bunch of headwind and I'm really sore today because I had to paddle my, my rear end off to get through that. Well, so today at one o'clock, guess what happened? I'm recording this podcast late because bees, same hive, swarm, and mama sauce is still here and I just... She came home from being out and I pointed up at the tree and I said, this time they're in that tree. And she was like, what in the world? Because by the way, hives don't usually swarm like this. And yesterday we did go into that hive, but I didn't go all the way in because there was just too much going on. And we did have it on our list today to go in that hive and look for queen cells, look for problems. It did not look very problematic when I went in there. There was still a good population of bees, but... I am taking this as a sign that those bees are unhappy. We will go through the whole hive today and see what's going on. But this time, this swarm at this point is so small. It's like two cups of like 16 ounces of bees. It's it's hardly any bees up in that tree. And as mom and I talked about it, because the hive doesn't look bad inside. We're actually wondering if like they lost a queen and have been requeening and we keep catching them and putting them somewhere. We're just going to leave that one out there and see where it goes. I'm I'm not going to run around with a ladder 50 feet in the air this time. They're way up in the tree. It's actually probably 30 feet. Um, it's right over the hive, too. We're just going to let them be and see if they go back in there. Like, maybe they have a queen, then they're going to go back in that hive. And if they don't, um, at this point, I need to concentrate on caring for the hives I have that are healthy. And I have two healthy hives. And I'll make sure those are good. And if that one has decided it's done, I'm going to have extra hive parts. But we'll look in there and see. And if I do see extra queen cells in there, I'm totally going to squish them. Sorry, guys. I hate squishing bees. But wow. The bees have been um, telling me they don't like where they are, I think. So we will also probably move that hive. Um, also on the uh, holler update is this. My garden is a mess. You know how I tell you all about getting the gardens ready and growing food and all that? Yeah, my garden's a mess. Uh, the The weather pattern this year paired with my schedule means that I literally have weeds up to my hips right now in there, in between the rows, because the chipping's not all done. And I have been doing a video series for you on this because even though it is a mess, my actual beds are in pretty good shape. You just can't see them through the rows. And um, I'm going to be showing you what you can do in a week, an hour at a time. So we're taking video before we start. And then I work for an hour or so and take a little video afterwards. I'll splice that all together and throw it up over on YouTube. I have a link to the channel in the show notes if you want to follow that. And I will, it's not in any playlist. I might make a playlist for this. Um, but it's it's embarrassing that I help people start their gardens. And my gardens looks like it does right now. So we're going to fix that. Um, also it makes it easier for me to get good production out of it. I mean, the good news is my potatoes are up. My green beans are looking good. My first wave of green beans, my peas are up. Like that stuff's all going well. I do have an issue with a chicken getting in there. So she keeps getting into my lettuce and scratching it up and then I have to re replant it, but I will get success from her as well. Anyway, um, it is a mess and I will be sharing with you what it's really like on video on YouTube. And that's all. That is the holler update. That That's basically what I'm doing to support our goals of more local income, making time for health and making time for recreation. I hit recreation and I'm hitting health. Um, the local income one is what I'm going to talk about next. And that's our holler roast coffee update. I decided to go for it. I, I think a couple of weeks ago, I talked to you should, about what I was thinking about related to should I grow the business and then somebody who listens got on the Zello channel that I'm also on Um, I'll put that link in the show notes too in case you're interested it's like a CB channel that a bunch of people who have shared interests um, participate in but got on and said you know what you should do is a post-mortem for why you failed before you fail so you can think of ways that you could fail and that was super helpful advice so I went through that 
talk to a bunch of people in the coffee world. I have a few more to talk to. Um, and one of them, and um, thank you very much for the introduction to Nick. You know who you are. My friend who I met at Jack Spearco's gave me an introduction to somebody still working in the coffee world. And he gave me like a rundown of roasters because I've been like scrambling around looking for roasters. And then I was lent these two roasters by another local roaster, but they will not do what I need them to do. And then this guy like hooked me up with a roaster that's much cheaper than going like to the $20,000 option. And they have a lease program so that I don't have to go all in right now. I have to sell, you know, basically 10 pounds of coffee to cover it every month. And it looks like it can handle the growth that I'm expecting in the next 24 months. So that's two years. So that means I don't have to go super expensive just to be able to handle the the growth trajectory that we're on. And I don't have to try to plan for explosive growth to cover a much larger roaster. So that's really exciting for me. And what we've been doing to get that ready is um, setting up some subscription plans. So if you love the coffee, I'm going to have some subscription plans, but we cannot grow Holler Roast for the next two years with just Holler Roast, which is a flavor that is a specific blend that we use. And the way I do Holla Roast is I taste a bunch of different coffees and I come up with the blend that's going to be our blend for the year or, you know, asterisk until they run out of those beans. And that means mostly they're small batches from small farms. And sometimes twice a year I change it, but usually once a year it's like, this is the flavor. And right now I am, by the way, in the middle of tasting. And I thought, well, why don't I open up some of this tasting experience for people who are like total coffee nerds like I am? So... One of the subscriptions we will offer is going to be a different roast every month that you can taste and then kind of give me feedback on just on your own impressions. And and it will be things that we've tasted over the that we like, but we didn't necessarily choose it for hollow roast. The other one will just be straight up hollow roast. And if you subscribe to that, you end up getting, you know, the same roast every time until we're out of that blend. And then we make a new blend and we'll we'll keep in communication about that. And I'm thinking, you know, there's going to be like the two pound a month and the four pound a month. But then somebody mentioned to me that might be too much coffee. So apparently, as it turns out, a lot of people don't drink as much coffee as I do. So we'll be, I think we're going to do a pound a month versus two pounds a month. We'll we'll kind of play with that. But that's going to launch by May 24th because May 24th, I am going on another podcast and talking about Holler Roast and I want to be able to offer those listeners subscriptions as well. So keep your eye out for subscriptions and I will offer you all my, my loyal listeners, a discount code on that when it comes out. So, you know, I'm going to sum up this holler update and coffee update with nothing went as planned. And I am at one with this a couple times. I was frustrated. I will admit, but we are still on track because although the grass is a bit taller than I would like it to be at this time of year, and we won't even talk about broken lawn mowers right now. Um, and I'm behind on drying my tea ingredients. I do need to get my bee balm like on racks this week. I'm still making forward momentum. We are way better off than we were this time last year. And things are looking pretty good for the coffee. Okay. Last segment of the day is project two of canning in eight projects. And I did want to take this moment to give you a word about Patreon. Patreon's another way you can support the show. And if you uh, head over to our website, there's now a Patreon button and I have started putting up premium content. So if you pay a dollar, if you want to support us at the uh, price of a dollar an episode, that's $4 a month, um, you will have access to premium content. And what's up there right now are previous episodes in zip files, like sets of 10. And then I have the coffee, the home roasters guide to coffee up there and we are going to be starting to release the canning project videos yay that's right so this is the project verbally that you're getting on uh on the podcast but we are making the videos and i've gone from i don't know how i'm going to make the videos to i found somebody to help me make the videos but i don't know when i'm making them to hey guys we're ready to start recording this coming weekend so I'll be walking you through visually um, how to do canning so that you can see what we're talking about here. So project number two is canning fruit and more specifically canning peaches. Why peaches? 
Well, because those are basically the first fruit I'm going to end up canning this year. So I thought, why not? Now, peaches are not ripe in Tennessee at this time. They might be ripe further south, but they are not ripe in Tennessee. But you know what? You can go to the store and buy peaches and just try this if you're learning how to can. There's no reason that you couldn't just buy peaches from the store as long as they're not gushy. So the method we'll talk about today is water bath canning. That was the same as last time, which was pickles. And we're going to talk about a raw pack, not a hot pack. And the reason this is project number two is it's a little bit more complex than than um, pickles and has a slightly higher failure rate, which makes you sad when you put all that work in and some of your jars don't work out. But the risks to your health are very low. And that's because there is sugar in the canning process. So you're making a sugar concentration, like a syrup that you can the fruit in when you do it. And that and sugar is a preservative, just like salt, right? So um, it's a very low risk. If you can improperly and it gets exposure to air, you know what happens? One of two things happens. It turns black from mold and you're not going to eat it. Or you just made peach wine. Those are the two things that happen. So you're not making anything that's going to kill you. So that's why it is project number two. Now, there are a couple of things that we're going to cover. Uh, first is choosing the fruit. Second is processing the fruit. Third is making the simple syrup. And then four, I'll go through the process. So let's start with choosing the fruit. This is going to sound a little counterintuitive. Um, when you are choosing peaches to process, you want them to be firm, not squishy. When you're choosing them to eat, you want them to be squishy because it usually means they're sweeter, right? So you want it firm, but not underripe uh, because the longer they're on the tree, the sweeter they get. But when you're at the store, it's kind of one of those beggars can't be choosers situations. So you want to find a peach that doesn't have a stone that's going to get stuck to the inside because that pulls all the fruit out. And you want it to be firm, but not squishy. And to do seven jars, you will need between 25 and 30 peaches. It just depends on the size of the peaches. Now, anybody who knows stuff about peaches, you have the, the freestone peaches. If you can find a freestone peach, that's going to be much easier to can than one that's more traditional where the, the flesh of the fruit is attached to the stone. However, uh, and they're, they're usually freestone varieties at the store. But when you're at the farmer's market, you may find one that's not a freestone peach. And that just means it's harder for you to pull it apart. I have some tricks for dealing with that, but we're talking easy here, right? So you want a freestone variety. You want one that's firm, but not squishy. You want it ripe and not green. And that's the best fruit you can get. If it's bruised, you, you're not going to want to can that because like bruises and canning turn from brown to browner and get gushy and nah, not good. So unbruised, good condition. And you want to buy it the same day you're going to can it if you can. So like if you're going to try this on a Saturday, get up, go to the store, get the peaches, come home, can. Peaches that sit around uh, have a tendency to get more bruising. They have a tendency to become overripe. And that's not your goal here. Your goal is to have a success with project number two. So go to the store, find a freestone variety, find them that are firm but not underripe, and then take them home and get yourself ready to can. What you need to gather to can, I'll talk to you later as part of the process. Um, second, making the syrup. I'm going to talk about the syrup separately from the whole process of the fruit, and that is that it's, it, so when you're canning fruit, you add sugar water. That's the traditional way to do it. And it's basically, you know, you heat water, put sugar in so it dissolves. That's your syrup. It's just like making simple syrup for your alcoholic beverages, right? So a light syrup is two cups of sugar to six cups of water, and that gives you seven cups of liquid. When I'm canning, I will double that and end up with leftovers because if I don't have enough sugary syrup stuff, not very happy about that. A medium syrup is three cups of sugar to six cups of wa water, and it yields about six and a half cups. And a heavy syrup, like super sweet, is four cups of sugar to six cups of water. I personally prefer the light sugar because I don't like a lot of sugar. So that's the one I usually use. Actually, it's not the one I usually use, but it's the one I would use if I were using sugar water. And it's... Um, as I said, the sugar helps preserve because sugar is a preservative. 
and that is why you are adding the sugar water that and because often peaches that you are processing are firm and not underripe, but they're not as sweet as what you would pull off a tree and just eat, right? So that adds a little bit of sweetness back to the fruit that's not there because they were taken off the, the tree sooner. Now, processing the fruit. Processing the fruit for canning, what you're going to need to do to the fruit is take the skin off and take the pit out and cut it in half. And you want to do this in a way that does not end up with the thing turning brown. So like with peaches, the way you do that is you boil water, you drop the peach in for like 30 to 45 seconds, fish it back out, and the peel will will, will um, just come right off. That's called blanching it. And then you cut it in half, pull the pit out, you have two halves of a peach, you can stack those in a jar. That's basically how that's going to work. And that's something that you can do all at once, or you can do it while you're canning. I like to do it while I'm canning. So, so let's just review the three things before we start. Choose your fruit. Get it the same day that you're going to do this project. Two, know how to process the fruit, which is know how to blanch it and take the peel off and that you're going to take the pits out and have, have a system in place to capture pits and peels in one place and fruit you're going to use in another. And then you need to have made your syrup. And I'm now going to walk you through the actual process. So this is the cold pack water bath canning process for fruit. I'm going to talk you through this in the order I would do it. There are a million different ways that you can organize yourself to do this. And if you're a little nervous, I'll talk to you about things you can do if you're nervous about the timing. But I'll just, first I'm going to walk you through how to do it. So first you get your seven jars, seven lids, and seven rings. And I prefer to use small mouth jars for this unless the peaches are so big they won't fit in it. The reason I like small mouth jars is when you put the, the peaches in, when the jar comes in at the top, it kind of keeps them low in the jar and below the the liquid level in the jar. So that's the shape I prefer unless for some reason I got giant peaches. And then really when I get giant peaches, I cut them into quarters instead of halves. So, you know, it's, it's up to you what you use. Some people find it easier to pack peaches neatly into wide mouth jars. I just like that extra little bit of lip in there for peaches in particular. So you're going to take those jars, you're going to put them in your canner, your water bath canner that we talked about on the pickle, how to make pickles. So you have like water bath canner, the base that goes under the jars to keep them from breaking. Then you fill the jars with hot water, you fill the canner with hot water, and you add, you know, maybe a quarter cup of vinegar. This is to keep the the calcium deposits from your water from ending up all over your jars and making them look not pretty. And you throw the lids, the seven lids and the seven rings in there, and you bring it to a boil. You're doing this because you want to sterilize the jars before you begin. Now, if you were pressure canning, I might take a shiner on that one. But because we're water bath canning, the worst thing that can happen to you here is you've ended up with an errant bacteria or yeast or something on a jar that you're using that didn't get killed in the process. And then it grows in the jar and it ruins all your fruit and you just wasted all that time and money. So... This is one where I will sterilize the jar. Now, there are other ways you can sterilize the jar that I've never tried that have to do with bleach and other things. I just boil them. It's easy. I don't have to have chemicals. I don't have to worry about chemical smell or flavor or rinsing or any of that. I just boil them. I boil them for 60 seconds and then I pull them out, put them to the side and start my process. Um, while the jars are boiling, I also start the syrup. So first I start the jars, then I start the simple syrup. And the one I like is two cups of sugar to six cups of water. But what I'm going to do is four cups of sugar to 12 cups of water in my big stock pot. Get that started, stir it real well. Two ways to do this. One, bring the water to boil and dump the sugar in and turn it off and it's done. That's one way. The other way is to heat them together. I prefer the first way rather than heating it with the sugar just because there's no risk of caramelizing any of that sugar on the bottom of the pot. And I learned that trick from beekeeping, by the way. So that's just my little shortcut there. So, you know, measure the water in, bring it to the boil, have the sugar pre-measured and ready to bring it, um, to pour it in when it's ready. And then on a third burner, that's right, you've now got three burners going, guys. 
bring a stock pot of water to a boil. I'll, my stock pot's relatively tall, so I'll fill it halfway. I just need to bring the water to a boil. Again, I use hot water going in to make it faster. And this is what I'm using to skin the peaches. So if the timing all works out the way I want it to, the jars have are boiling right as I'm starting to get a boil on the water where I'm going to skin the peaches and the simple syrup is basically ready. That's my goal here. That doesn't always happen. Sometimes I have to wait a little for one or another to get done, but I don't start peeling my peaches until my jars are sterile. And I do, what I'll do in that situation is pull, I fish the um, rings and lids out and I leave the jars in the canner and I turn the burner down to low. And this is where I'm going to tell you my method and then I'm going to tell you a trick if you don't work as fast. So I work pretty fast when it comes to this. So this is the scenario we're at at this point. Jars are sterilized. Water for the peach peeling is boiling. I have a cutting board to the right of the stove. My simple syrup, I've dumped the sugar and turned the burner off. So I take my first three peaches and I drop them in and I set a timer for 45 seconds and then I pull them out and put them on the cutting board and I put my next three peaches in and while that timer is going, I usually just have a timer going that I can look at rather than a beep every time that requires interaction. Uh uh-uh, uh, I just have a timer going on my phone. I, I use my hands to pull the covers off those peaches. I cut them in half and then I take my first jar out and I put the halves stacked with the cut side down. So they're kind of stacking like, um, kind of like cards. You just want to stack them on top of each other, cut side down. And three peaches is usually all I need for a jar. Sometimes I need three and a half. Sometimes I need four. It depends on the size of the peaches. Sometimes you might need five. When you're buying your peaches, think about how many of those will stack in a jar. Get them in there. Timer's gone off. I pull the next three peaches out. And then I put the jar by the simple syrup that I've just packed and I pour the simple syrup in and I clean off the rim with a paper towel with vinegar to make sure there's no sugar because you do not want sugar on the rim. It will keep your seal from happening right. Run my finger around the top of that jar. I put the lid on. I hand tighten it. I don't use a jar lid tightener. And then I use my jar tongs, the ones that pick up the jar, to put my first jar back in that pot. Take the next jar out throw three peaches in, peel, slice, stack that jar, pull the peaches out when it's been 45 seconds, put the jar by the simple syrup, pour the simple syrup in, get the rim on. And I just repeat that until I have packed seven jars. Now, because fruit is all different sizes, hopefully 30 peaches will get you through this. If you're worried about it, just have more peaches ready to go. But what you want to be doing is pulling the peels off and processing the peaches as you go so you don't end up with a bunch of peaches left over at the end that you pulled the skins off and now you're having to wait for your next cycle, right? So when you are pouring the syrup over, I forgot to mention, make sure there's a half inch of headroom at the top. So they need to be fully submerged. They will not have gone up above that that leany any part of the small mouth jar. And the syrup is well over the top of them. So once you have all seven jars done, All you have to do is make sure the boiling water level is up over the top of the jars by an inch in there. Turn that burner up to high and when it's at a rolling boil, you will process the quarts for for 30 minutes. Now, if you decided to do pints, you were only fitting two or one and a half peaches in per jar. Hopefully you were using wide mouth jars in that case because I find the small mouth jars don't take as many peaches for the pints. Those process for 25 minutes. Personally, I only do quarts on peaches. It's not worth doing pints because it takes like, it, it's funny how the pint quart thing works out. It takes more than twice the pint level peaches to do a quart, even though a quart is twice what a pint is, right? And it, I have to process the pints for 25 minutes and the quarts for 30 minutes. So I only have to process them five minutes longer. Now this is assuming that you live at a thousand feet or below, by the way. If you live above a thousand feet, go pull up a chart on the internet. I'll leave a link in the show notes that shows you how to adjust the processing time. You'll process them for more at higher altitudes, but process them for 30 minutes and then you turn off the stove and you wait five minutes. You know why you wait five minutes? 
because you are a more patient person than I am. That's why you wait five minutes because I'm not this patient. But if you're smart, you wait five minutes because that'll make sure all the bubbles and bumps stop happening on your water bath canner so you don't burn your skin through drips like shooting out of the pot. Take your jar lid, no, not jar lid, but your jar lifter, your jar tongs. Carefully move each jar out where you're going to keep them overnight. So you move them from the canning container to, I have just like the space between my coffee maker and my microwave where I put them where nobody likes to bother anything. I have a towel down so I don't burn my counter and I move them carefully that direction. When you're doing this, make sure your pets and your kids and husbands or wives who might be underfoot are out of your way because if you trip over them, you are carrying something that's very hot and it's glass and somebody could get burnt. You can put an eye out, man. I'm just saying. Um, so you put them over there, leave them overnight. I like to leave them. I mean, they say leave them 24 hours, but overnight you want them to cool down all the way. So, you know, if they were worked and then you're going to test the jars, the way you test the jars is you unscrew the lid and you see if that lid is properly suctioned down. You can actually, before you unscrew them, you can like tap the middle. And if, if it goes, duk, duk, that means the lid did not seal properly. And that means that you should put that jar in the fridge and eat it that week with your yogurt or whatever you're going to do with it. Um, or you can reprocess it, but I don't like to do that. I just eat them if they fail. And I always take the lids off, like the, the screw part of the lid, not the lid lid, and make sure those lids are sealed by, I usually lift the jar by the lid to see if it's sealed enough. I have to say, with peaches, I have about a 10% fail rate on my seals. And I'm really super careful about making sure the rings are done. I think it's because when they're water bath canning, that simple syrup gets up on that rim sometimes. But I'm also pushing the envelope when I do it. So when, I, when I'm when i disciplined about, pe- I don't peel mine. So I've just told you to like do as I say, not as I do. I don't like, I like to eat peels, so I leave them on. I think the peel is related to this issue. So um, whenever I've peeled peaches, I don't have any jar failures. It's kind of funny. So you want to test them, make sure those lids are on. And then label them and store them in the dark and store them without the rings. Why do you want to store them without the rings, you ask? Well, two reasons. One, rings, if you leave them on, allow a place for moisture to get stuck. And that means you might end up with rust on your lid. And rust will eat through metal. And if rust eats all the way through metal, you've just totally ruined your stuff. Plus, a rust ring on your canned goods doesn't look very pretty if you're giving them away at Christmas. That's one reason. Two, if your jar fails, so let's say the seal was there when you tested it, but for some reason, something was still alive in the jar, what'll happen is um, organic growth. And when organic growth happens, it, it releases gases and it pushes that lid off. Now, if you have a ring on, it's still holding the ring over the top. So it'll like blip out, blip, 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 and it'll keep sucking that lid down. And you'll never know that that thing failed unless it molds. So I like the store without rings so that I know like, cause what'll happen if you store without rings and there was for some reason something lived through the process that little, like you'll go to take it out and you'll notice the lid wasn't properly sealed. That's the other part. So when you open a jar of canned goods, it should go thoop when you're opening it. If you don't hear that noise and it doesn't seem like it was sealed all the way, smell it. It's like, I, here's how I open a jar. I open the jar, thoop, smell it smells fine looks fine okay i'm good and again the risk on fruit is like you're gonna get a little tipsy because you're gonna see if it's moldy um and you're gonna make alcohol if you have sugar and yeast in a an environment like that so that is how you do peaches now if you don't think that you're gonna be able to move fast enough as i do to do one jar at a time here's what you do you keep those jars in in that water so they're hot because you're going to be pouring the hot syrup in. If you let the jars cool down, pack them cold with the peaches and then pour the simple syrup in that's hot, um, well, that jar just might give you a little surprise. We all know what happens to glass. We all know what happens to ice when we throw it in a warm glass of water, right? Same things happen happens to glass when you change the temperature. So if you don't think you can do that and you want to reduce the the pressure of having that 45 second timer for the skinning, here's what you do. You get a stock pot, put cold water in it, put, um, ah, 
couple tablespoons of lemon juice in there and you fill it about halfway up and then you skin all your peaches. So you have your, your jar, jars are hot. You got your simple syrup. You got your boiling water for the peaches. Skin your peaches and cut them in half and put them in the lemon water. That'll keep them from oxidizing so they don't look brown. Because if you just put them like out at room temperature for 45 minutes while you're doing this, then they'll be brown. Put them in that lemon water. And then once you have them all done, you can just start packing those jars one at a time. Pour the simple syrup over, cleaning that rim off, making sure it's a good seal and go from there. So that's how you do it if you don't work as fast as I do. But you'll find... When you get into canning, like the first time you're going to do it that second way I told you. And then the next time you're going to be like, okay, I get how to take a skin off peaches. And if you want to get really good at this, just go buy like two bushels of peaches and and process them. And you'll be really good at that by the time you're through the, the two bushels. We have a whole rotation we get going here. So once a year we get a bunch of peaches and like they get organized by most ripe to least ripe and then we start at the most ripe side and we like put those aside to eat because they're usually too ripe to can and then we start canning at the most ripe going to least ripe and we try to keep those things cool but man boy peaches more than two or three days just get beyond the point where we can can them so that is the second project i would do remember the first project was a couple episodes ago i'll throw that in the show notes that's canning pickles Second project is canning fruit. We'll have the third project soon. And remember, we will have um, the new video series coming up in about two weeks. I'm starting recording on Saturday this week. Woohoo! Maybe Sunday. Anyway, this weekend we are recording our first episode and hopefully our second to begin putting that up on the Patreon site. If you want to subscribe to that premium content, just Go to livingfreeintennessee.com, click on the Patreon button, and it is a dollar an episode or four dollars a month. Actually, it's like a dollar an episode, except for you get four and a half episodes a month, whatever. Yeah, something like that. Anyway, remember if you like the show, you can also support us while drinking a marvelous cup of hand roasted coffee. Just head on over to livingfreeintennessee.com and click on, on coffee. And with that, hey guys, get out there and make it a great week. i